the last, well, first of all, a little bit about myself. I've, I've been an academic for the last 20 years working on policing and community development issues, but before that I was an organizer for a number of years. So I've tried to walk that line between research and advocacy. And uh, in New York, I run a center called the Policing and Social Justice Project that does a lot of work fighting back against uh, gang databases, gang conspiracy cases, and talking about exactly the kind of community-based anti-violence efforts that are needed to break the cycle of violence. But I thought I'd talk a little bit about a kind of national perspective. For the last couple of years, I've been crisscrossing the United States, uh, about 25 cities a year, uh, speaking in meetings like this, working with groups like the Advancement Project, ACLU, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, and a lot of smaller local community-based groups like, like we have here tonight. And in doing this work, what I see is a, a profound competition between two different visions of what safety could be. The dominant vision that's out there that drives a lot of the discourse about the problems with policing and the criminal justice system is what uh, many of us call a procedural justice approach. And this is the idea that the problem with policing is that the police are biased, unprofessional, discourteous, and brutal, and sometimes racist, but the solution to that is a set of procedural reforms to make policing more professional, more closely tied to the law, less biased in their behavior. And this gets expressed as a series of recommendations for improvements of training and community policing. And on the surface, this sounds pretty appealing. We, we're kind of tired of really bad policing. The problem is, is that a totally lawful, well-trained, unbiased, legal, low-level drug arrest is still going to ruin some young person's life for no damn good reason. It is, it does not matter how procedurally proper that arrest is, it is still fundamentally unjust. We've had this war on drugs for almost 50 years. Drugs are cheaper, easier to get, more potent than they've ever been. We got overdoses through the roof. Any young person in our country can get any kind of drugs they want anytime they want them. We got nothing to show for this war on drugs except literally millions of people sent to prison. Narcotics units do not need anti-bias training. We need to end the war on drugs. But what we hear is not that. What we hear from the Obama Justice Department and the people who run the elite research institutions is, well, we need to give the police uh, implicit bias training. That's one of my favorites. How many people have heard of implicit bias training? I'm sure they do some of that here in Detroit. I didn't get a chance to, to look that up before I got here. Um, implicit bias training is based on this idea, well, we all have unconscious stereotypes that, that maybe shape our behavior in some way. But it's unconscious, it's unintentional, and if we, if we just remind police that racism is a problem in the U.S. and ask them could they just please shoot fewer black people that, you know, this would be a really big improvement and, and thank you very much. Well, the problem with that, there are many problems with that. First of all, the research is really problematic. But even if the research behind this is robust, we got a lot of explicit racism in policing. It's not just unconscious and implicit. You just had a whole bunch of officers fired here in Detroit for explicit racism. When we look for racism in policing, we find it. The emails, the chat boards, the official statements of police union leaders in many parts of the country. That's not implicit bias, that's explicit bias. And no amount of could you please be nice to black people is going to fix that.
But it's also, I think, a mistake to think that the problems of race and policing can be reduced to individual officer discretionary decision making. Because the fact is, is that the racism is built into the mission of policing. It's built into the mission. The police say, well, you know, we just go where the crime is. How can that be racist? We just go and we make arrests where the crime is. We just go where the 911 calls are. Now that's not entirely true. There's a lot of discretionary policing that goes on, especially around the drug war. They're not running buy and bust operations in the high-rise office buildings down the street here, and I can guarantee you they are filled with drugs. <laughs> but even if, even if they just went where the crime was, there's a reason why there are more calls for service in these places. Because there are a lot of communities in this, problem, in this country that have got a lot of problems. But those problems are the result of a long legacy and the current active production of racism and economic inequality. It's not accidental. It's not because of individual or group moral failure. It's not because there's some deficiency in these folks. They live in places that have been systematically discriminated against, and they've got a lot of problems as a result. They got a lot of anger. They got a lot of trauma that they're trying to work through, and they're not getting any help. So that when we say to the community, you've got a problem, the solution is we're gonna send more police to solve that problem for you, that reproduces racial inequality, no matter how procedurally fair it's done. Because the whole idea that the solution to our problems comes in the form of an armed police officer is part of the problem. And this is my beef with community policing. Well, who, who could be against community policing? I, I hear your chief is in love with community policing. Community police, don't we want the police to know us, to treat us with respect, to have some idea who the good people are and who the bad people are in the community, to work with the community to identify problems and to come up with solutions? That, that sounds good, but first of all, the idea of community for the police is something that they create. They choose the community. They decide who represents the community. There are no homeless people in those community meetings. There are no formerly incarcerated people in those community meetings. There are no young people in those community people. There are no undocumented people in those community meetings. You know the kind of folks who populate those meetings. And if any of those people on that list do show up, are they made to feel welcome? Do they have a real role in shaping the prior? No. But even if they did, the whole idea of community policing is that the community brings its problems to the police to solve. But what tools do the police have to solve our community problems? They got guns and handcuffs and ticket books and threats and coercion. Those are not the solutions that we need for our community problems. Do they have affordable housing, eviction protection? drug treatment on demand, quality mental health services. They don't have any of that stuff. They got threats and abuse, coercion and punishment. So this idea that if we could just make the police more professional and nicer to us, that that's somehow gonna fix our problems is completely misguided. And we've gotta call that out. Because all that does is build up the idea that police are the solution to all our problems. But that's not real safety. There's another vision of safety that's out there. And we heard a lot of elements of it here tonight. It's very exciting as I travel around the country to see how much of this work is really going on. But it's not being talked about in these elite circles where, real, where policy is being made. So I'm gonna give you a few examples that I've come across, across the country, uh, of people trying to do this. And all of it is driven by a vision that says the way we change this 
is to build individuals and communities up instead of tearing them down. So the first example is from uh, Ithaca, New York, in upstate New York. Turns out they have a drug problem there, like every community in America right now. But the mayor there understood that a policing-led strategy is not the solution. It's just going to mean more incarceration, more cycling people through the criminal justice system at more cost and no good impact. So he said, let's try something totally different. Let's put everything on the table as a possibility. And let's bring in some experts, some people who do harm reduction, who do drug treatment. Let's bring in some people who've been drug involved, who've been incarcerated. And let's kind of come up with a blueprint. So they laid out some principles and they put together some ideas, and, but they didn't stop there. They took it to the community. They held town hall meetings, they did focus groups to try to make sure that these ideas would work in the community, that there would be support for them. Well, it's called the Ithaca Plan, and you can look it up, and there are no police in it. There's drug treatment on demand, safe injection facilities, needle exchange programs, other kinds of harm reduction issue, uh, initiatives, peer-to-peer -peer education efforts and targeted economic development efforts to try to target those places where drug dealing and drug using have produced the most harms for the community. That's what public safety looks like, not charging the dealer with homicide when someone has an overdose, which is the main response we've gotten to the opioid crisis. We've gotten a lot of talk, a lot of talk about, well, these kids need help and we need more rehabilitation. But if you look, the arrests are unchanged. The incarcerations are still happening. The penalties are being made harsher. My next example is, is from New York. I'm sure some of you heard, have heard about the efforts there to close Rikers Island, the, the city jail complex. Very exciting. I'm, I think I'm wearing my Close Rikers t-shirt under this. I just remembered. Um, and they've done a tremendous job of pointing out the harms that Riker Island, Rikers Island produces, the brutality, the, the violence, the massive recidivism rates, the huge costs that are involved in running it. But that alone, they understood, is not going to be enough to get us over the finish line. Because the reality is, there are still communities where people feel the need to call the police because there are problems that are not otherwise being addressed. So part two of their campaign is the build communities part. And they spent a number of months convening work groups made up of community-based organizations, academic experts, researchers, and people who've been affected by these systems, and issued a Build Communities report with sections on housing and health care and education and youth services that lays out what we could do with the money we spend on Rikers Island to actually help communities be safer. And we've got to have both parts of that equation. We've got to divest from police and jails and prisons and invest in communities. It's not enough to just de-police. It's not enough to just close down a facility because communities are hurting. They need help. And we've got to have both of these parts. So the last example I'll give you is from uh, Salinas, California. It's an agricultural community in the Central Valley of California. I uh, was able to spend a few days out there last month meeting with them. They have undertaken a comprehensive community organizing strategy under the label of Build Healthy Community, Salinas. And in, they've put together a vision of what healthy communities in Salinas would look like with adequate housing, with basic health care, with community-based mental health services, with real drug treatment, with uh, culturally appropriate trauma services, 
stronger schools, restorative justice programs. And now, instead of just putting it out there as a vision, they're organizing. But they're not just organizing in a general way, they're doing it in a targeted way. They've said, we got city council members in Salinas who claim to be our friends, but every time we turn around, they want to open up another youth facility, a youth detention facility, they want to hire more police, they want to put police in the schools. These are not our friends. And the way we're going to get rid of them is that we're going to take this package of ideas in a specific council district and start doing the organizing, going door to door, holding town hall meetings, doing house meetings, saying, why can't we have drug treatment on demand in our community? Why can't we have adequate mental health facilities? Why can't we have jobs for our young people? And when politicians hear those demands and say, oh, we can't afford it, we can't do it, we have a message that is, what about that new jail wing you just paid for? What about those school police you just tried to put in the school? There is money, you're just spending it on the wrong thing. And they had a big victory. About six weeks ago, the city tried to put a whole bunch of police in the elementary schools. Using federal money, they said, oh, we got this federal money, it's free. So of course, why wouldn't we want to do this? But because the community had been organizing, they saw right through that. For one thing, that money runs out, and then they got to take it out of the city budget. So it's never really free. But even if it were free, that's not how we want to produce safety in our schools. And you're like, elementary schools, why elementary schools? Well, that's where school policing always begins. The origin of school policing in the 1950s was about responding to juvenile crime among teenagers by putting police in elementary schools, not to make the schools safer, but to win the kids over to the idea that police are their friends and that what's needed is more respect for authority in the guise of the police officer. It's about an ideology of authoritarianism that says the solution to every problem comes in the form of a police officer. And this is exactly what we have to call bullshit on. Thank you.